Hello everybody, welcome to the second lecture of this massive online, open online course on philosophical foundations of social research. Before moving on to the second lecture, prima facie let us first see, uh, prima facie let us see what we have discussed in the first lecture. In the first lecture, we have discussed how philosophy in its pre 19th century incarnation was divided into two parts namely natural philosophy and social and moral philosophy. Okay. As we have discussed natural philosophy is nothing but science in the present sense of the term and moral philosophy is nothing but ethics in the present, terms, present sense of the term. Natural philosophers, I mean scientists in the present sense of the term, were engaged in epistemological questions, whereas the proponents of ethics or moral philosophers were engaged in ethical questions. When we try to integrate natural philosophy on the one hand and social and moral philosophy on the other, or putting it differently, when we try to integrate epistemology on the one hand and and Mm, ethics on the other uh, on the other hand okay we tend to arrive at modern philosophy of science okay then what we have discussed when we when we try to integrate uh, epistemology with ethics or natural philosophy with social and moral philosophy we tend to arrive at modern philosophy of science and then we have discussed what may be the possible methods of science Okay, namely uh, from, from 17th century to the 19th century, the whole 300 years, 3 centuries, that what may be the possible methods of science, what we have witnessed, they are now oh, inductivism and hypothesis. Okay. Inductivism suggests that the method of science is the method of induction. Uh, on the contrary, hypothesis suggests that the method of science is the method of hypothesis. Inductivism was pioneered by Francis Bacon, whereas uh, hypothesism was pioneered by uh, uh, Rene Descartes. Inductivism is rooted in empiricism, whereas hypothesism is rooted in uh, or grounded in uh, rationalism. Experience, uh, I mean, empiricism is based on experience, whereas rationalism is based on reason. And in this sense, we have we have discussed how uh, what are the steps in 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 uh, inductivism and hypothesism so far as production of scientific knowledge is concerned and uh, uh, how in how in empiricism we we uh, tend to start with collecting uh, observational data then we tend to put forward uh, tentative gen generalization which must be verified and once it is verified, it the tentative generalization becomes a law. In hypothesis or, or in rationalism, we always start with a hypothesis. It is a tentative solution to a problem or hunch. Then we must test the hypothesis. If the, if the hypothesis is tested right, then it must be accepted. If the hypothesis is tested wrong, then it must be rejected. Okay. And what may be the possible uh, characteristics of, of, of what are the character, central characteristics of, of uh, empiricism and rationalism we have discussed. Okay. This, is, this was what we had discussed in the first lecture. Coming to the second lecture, we are going to focus on one of the pioneering works within social sciences in general and sociology in particular and what are it what are their methodological implications and from here we are going to look at look at positivism and how august comte who is considered the the founder of sociology okay uh, earlier he used to use this term social physics from social physics he he coined the term sociology mm, uh, of course there are there are certain uh, arguments that um, 
where people very often make that uh, no August Comte cannot be considered the father of sociology or founder of sociology. But I, al or I also uh, respect those arguments, no doubt about it. But, but for the time being, we will go ahead with, uh, with August Comte's reflection on, on positivism and how he has come to this stage of positivism. Okay. The 20th century begins with the emergence of a school of thought called positivism. Positivism is an extremely well known and till recently very influential uh, theory of science and its method. It is a closely knit set of tenets formulated with an admirable amount of consistency and clarity. Okay. But before coming to positivism, how August Comte tried to design different stages through which we have made a transition to positivism. Okay. The and it is fam popularly known as Comte's law of three stages. The law of three stages is an idea developed by August Comte in his work, The Course in Positive Philosophy, that st which states that society as a whole and each particular science develops through three mentally conceived stages. One, the theological stage, second, the uh, metaphysical stage and the third, the positivistic or scientific stage. Okay. Whereas, positivism was synonymous with science, theology and, and metaphysics they were not considered scientific, they are not scientific, whereas this is scientific, positivistic stage is scientific stage. We will we'll see how, how we will go one by one in this lecture okay? um, and then we will move on to epistemology and ontology uh, towards the end of today's lecture. Okay? What is the theological stage? The theological stage by Comte refers to explosion by personified deities and in this stage uh, or, or rather uh, I mean uh, uh, people, people believed that, that all phenomena of nature are the creation of the divine or supernatural and people failed to discover the natural causes of various phenomena and hence attributed them to supernatural or divine power. For example, if I say who has created us, who has created human beings, who has created plants, who has created air, who has created energy, who has created water, who has created river, who has created seas, who has created oceans who has created this land, who has created forest. Okay. In the theological stage, the belief was that, that gods, goddesses, supernatural forces, they have created this. But they, it also has, has its own, uh, own arguments. We will we'll see okay, what kind of argument. Comte tried to break this stage into three sub-stages. One is fetishism, secondly polytheism and thirdly monotheism. When I say fetishism, Comte refers to fetishism as the primary stage of the theological stage thinking. Throughout this stage, primitive people believe that inanimate objects have living spirit in them, also known as animism. People worship inanimate objects like trees, stones, a piece of wood, volcanic eruptions, etc. Through this practice, people believe that all things root from a supernatural source. Okay? This is fetishism. Okay? 
like inanimate objects. Uh, objects like uh, 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 tree, wood, and so on, and they have they have they have a supernatural source. Polytheism, I mean, at one point of time, fetishism began to bring about doubt in the mi minds of its believers. That how is it possible that we'll worship only tree, uh, ocean, river, and so on? As a result, people mm, turned towards polytheism, the explanation of things through the use of many gods, multiple gods. Okay? You will find. And primitive people believe that all natural forces are controlled by different gods different goddesses and, and a few examples would be god of water, god of rain, god of fire, god of air, god of earth and so on. And monotheism which is the last stage of the theological stage thinking because these are mentally conceived uh, ideas. Okay? That monotheism believing in one god or God in one, one God or God in one. Okay? Then you will find, find that, that we must, I mean by the proponents of monotheism, they attributed all to a single supreme deity. People believe, uh, primitive people believe a single theistic entity is responsible for the existence of the universe, only one God is responsible for the creation of this universe, whether it is they are human beings, whether they are plants, whether they are uh, uh, oceans, whether they are um, forests, whatever you say, uh, only one supernatural source. Okay? Then basically the theological stage suggests that, that there is a divine power, there is a supernatural force which has created human beings, which has created this universe. Okay? The second stage comes in the in the in the, the in the law of three stages. The second stage is known as the metaphysical stage. If I have to pose a question now, that who has created us in the uh, who has created us, so far as the theological stage thinking is concerned, then we'll say that no, it, we are created by. Gods and goddesses, divine power, supernatural forces. In the metaphysical stage, the same question will be answered differently because the metaphysical stage stopped believing in gods and goddesses. Rather, the metaphysical stage started believing in nature. Who has created us? No, no, gods and goddesses have not created us in the metaphysical stage. Rather, nature has created us. Then, then our creation is mediated by nature. That is why human beings always contemplate on nature. That is why we, they try, try to worship nature. Nature as mother god. Okay? That is why, uh, please do not confuse between theological stage and metaphysical stage. Who has created us? This, the question elicits answers from the theological stage like this, the gods, goddesses, supernatural forces, divine power, they have created us. On the contrary, the theological stage suggests that no, gods and goddesses have not created us, divine power has not created us, supernatural forces have not created us, rather we are the creations of nature. The metaphysical stage Hence, is the, the extension of the theological stage. The metaphysical stage refers to explanation by impersonal abstract concepts. People often try to believe that God is an abstract being. They believe that an abstract power or force guides and determines events in the world and metaphysical uh, thinking discards belief in a concrete God. The nature of inquiry was legal and rational in nature. 
that is why nature has created us. For example, for example, in classical Hindu Indian society, the principle of the transmigration of the soul, the conception of rebirth, notions of pursuant were largely governed by metaphysical of uphill. Now, the same question who has created us, if in the theological stage was responded to by no gods and goddesses have created us, in the metaphysical stage nature has created us in the positivistic or scientific stage because by that time uh, so many uh, uh, research work was also going on in the biological sciences, Charles Darwin and so on, the origin of species, uh, uh, principle of natural selection and so on. Marx was writing in the 19th century, many, many uh, people were engaged in this uh, research that who has created us. Now, we are, crea we are the creations of human action, human labor, uh, we are the creation of, of um, uh, we are, we are uh, creation of, uh, uh, creation is, uh, as the argument was posed in the, the evolution of species and so on. Okay. We have evolved over a period of time. Okay. Okay. The, the, the positivistic, that is why the positivistic stage is also known as the scientific stage. It refers to scientific explanation that is based on observation, experiment and comparison. Positive explanations rely upon a distinct method, the scientific method for their justification. Today people attempt to establish cause and effect relationship. Okay? Positivism is purely, a, a pure, uh, is purely an intellectual way of looking at the world and also it emphasizes observation and classification of data and facts. Okay? Comte, however, was conscious of the fact that the three stages of thinking, namely the theological stage, the metaphysical stage and the scientific stage or positivistic stage may or do coexist in the same society or in the same mind and may not always be successive. You will, you may find they mutually coexist, they, uh, they, there may be conflicts with each other, but they may coexist. Comte proposed a hierarchy of the sciences based on historical sequence with areas of knowledge passing through these stages in order of complexity. The simplest and most remote areas of knowledge, namely mechanical or physical, are the first to become scientific according to Comte. These are followed by the more complex sciences, those considered closest to us. The sciences according to Comte's law of three stages developed in this in, in such order as mathematics, okay, then astronomy, okay, and then physics, then chemistry, then biology, and then sociology. Okay. These are the, this is called hierarchy of sciences in Comptian uh, uh, schema and sociology as a science of society, okay. uh, Comte said it is the queen science, queen of all sciences, okay. a science of society thus uh, is thus the, the, the queen science uh, in, in Comte's hierarchy as it would be the most fundamentally complex. Since Comte saw social science as an observation of human behavior and knowledge, his definition of sociology included observing humanity's development of science itself. Because of this, Comte presented this introspective field of study as the science above all others. Sociology would uh, both complete the bo body of positive sciences. Okay. by discussing humanity uh, as the last unstudied scientific field and would link the fields of science together in human history, showing the intimate relationship uh, of scientific development on the one hand and 
and social development in the, on the other. Scientific development on the, on the one hand and uh, development of economy, culture and polity on the other. To count this, this the, the, the law of three stages made development of sociology inevitable and necessary. Comte saw the formation of, of his law as an active use of sociology, but this formation was dependent on uh, other sciences reaching the positive stage. Other sciences means these, these sciences. We have not reached sociology out of vacuum, but this is a hierarchy of sciences from mathematics, astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology and then sociology for Comte. Okay. This formation hence was dependent on the other sciences reaching the positive stage, positivistic stage. Comte's three stage law, Comte's law of three stages would not have evidence for a positivistic stage without the observed progression of other sciences through these three stages. The sociology and its and its first law of three stages would be developed after other sciences were developed out of the metaphysical stage. With the observation of these developed sciences becoming the scientific practice used in a positivistic stage of sociology. This special dependence on other sciences contributed to uh, Comte's view of sociology being the most complex. Okay? It also provided an explanation for sociology being the last science to be developed. This is the last one okay? for Comte, not for others. Okay. Comte saw these results of, of his three stage law and, and, and obviously sociology mm, as not only inevitable but good. In Comte's eyes, the positivistic stage was not only the most evolved stage but also the stage best for mankind okay? because it is based on science, scientific inquiry. Through a continuous development of positive sciences, Comte hoped that human beings would perfect their knowledge of the world and make real progress uh, to improve the welfare of humanity. Uh, he acclaimed the positivistic stage as the highest complement of the human mind and as having natural superiority over the other more primitive stages. Overall, overall if I have to recapitulate uh, what we have discussed now, that overall Comte saw his his law of three stages as the starting point of, of the scientific field of sociology as a positive science. He believed this development, he believed that this, this such development, such, such uh, progressive development to positivistic or scientific stage was the key to uh, completing positive philosophy and would finally allow humans to study every observable aspect of the universe. For Comte, sociology's human centered studies would relate the fields of science to each other as progressions in human history and make positive philosophy one coherent body of knowledge. Comte presented the, pre the, the positivistic stage as the final stage of final state of all sciences which would allow human knowledge to be perfected leading to human progress. Then what are the central tenets of positivism? Let us see. What are the central characteristics of positivism? Let us see. Okay. And then we will have a quick comparison between empiricism, rationalism and positivism. Okay. And then we will move on to epistemology and ontology. Okay. What are the central features or central characteristics or central tenets of positivism? First is methodological. What is this? The proponents of positivism suggest that science is distinct from all areas of human activity or creativity because science possesses a method unique to it. That other areas of or uh, 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 non sciences, okay, they do not have a unique method that science has. That is called methodological. The second one is methodological monism. Okay, what is that unique method? We will see. The second one is methodological monism. Okay. Monism means single, one. Dualism means two. 
okay pluralism means many okay methodological monism what is that so that there is only one method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter it may be astronomy it may be physics it may be chemistry it may be biology it may be mathematics whatever you say okay that there is only one method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter no what is then that that single method what is that unique method positivists go ahead with empirical model inductivist model that that they suggested that the method of science is the method of induction that from particular instances we move to generalizations okay we have already discussed this i mean inductivism or empiricism okay now the fourth one is that the hallmark of science lies in the fact that all scientific statements must be systematically verifiable that inductivist schema also suggested no, that uh, the tentative generalization must be verified once verified it becomes a law right then science must be neutral science must be objective in nature okay there should not be any subjective bias prejudice okay uh, like non sciences may have okay and there must be a binary or a dichotomy between dichotomy means two opposed groups okay if i say black white subject object uh, image text right then uh, good bad right wrong these are binaries or dichotomies okay there must be a dichotomy or binary between fact and value if i say this is a computer this is a computer okay then this is a fact but if i say this computer looks beautiful then i add value to it because for me it may look beautiful for some others uh, for you it may not look beautiful okay that that's why i add value to it that is a and science does not believe in values in the positivistic scheme science always believes in facts okay that's why uh, the positivists or the proponents of positivism argue that that facts in science or scientific facts are value neutral whereas values do not have any factual content okay and science being the paragon of knowledge does not have any value commitments it only has commitment towards facts as he, as empiricist suggested inductivist suggested that we must start with observations positivists also argue that we must start with observations but uh, why no precisely because observations are pure and indubitable observations are pure in the sense that it they do not have any recourse to theory theoretical commitment and observations cannot be doubted indubitable means cannot be doubted okay and there must be a unilateral relationship between between observations and theory observation always observation always leads to theory but but theory does not lead to observation sorry theory does not lead to observation there is always a unilateral relationship between observation and theory okay observation observations always lead to theory generation but theory does not lead to observation in the positivistic schema okay only in the positivistic schema okay when we discuss popper and so on when we move on progressively we will find that how theory also may uh, lead to observation that cannot be any observation without any theoretical commitment okay or any perspective we'll see that later on now for the time being then in the positivistic schema okay that 
observation leads to theory generation, but the converse is not true. I mean, in other words, theory does not lead to observation. I mean, uh, putting it succinctly, that theories are observation dependent, whereas observations are theory independent. Okay? Observations are, uh, are, are an independent variable, whereas theory is a dependent variable. Okay? Fine. Okay? Then we will we'll see, we will come to uh, such comparison between empiricism, rationalism and positivism. You will find in empiricism, we start with observations. We start with observational data without recourse to any theory. In rationalism, we start with um, a hypothesis and in positivism, we start with observations. In, in, in empiricism, uh, we tend to provide a tentative generalization uh, that needs to be verified. In rationalism, we tend to test our hypothesis whether it is right or wrong. Okay. In positivism, we do that with a set of logs. Okay. In the empiricist schema, once the tentative generalization is verified, it becomes a law. And in rationalist schema, if the hypothesis is tested right, then it must be accepted. If it is tested wrong, then it must be rejected. And in the positivistic schema, from a set of logs, we tend to arrive at a set of statements describing initial conditions. Okay? I mean, if they, they, this must be premise number 1, this must be premise number 2. Okay? And you need at least in logic, in philosophy, you need at least two premises. In social sciences, in sciences also today, you need at least two premises to arrive at a conclusion. This is our conclusion. If I say a set of logs, a set of initial conditions and a set of statements describing the phenomenon to be explained, I mean if this is a set of set of logs L1 to Ln, this is uh, a set of statements describing the initial conditions I1 to In and therefore, you we tend to arrive at an explanation. Then a set of set of logs, a set of statements describing the initial conditions and a set of statements describing the phenomenon to be explained. I mean from, from observations, logs, initial conditions and explanation. Okay? This is how we try to compare and contrast empiricism, rationalism and positivism. Okay? Now, we will discuss epistemology and ontology. As we have already pointed out, and these are significant implications for our, for, for the way theoretical foundations and methodological devices have been deployed in social science research today. Uh, this is very important. Uh, epistemology, as we already know, that it is a body or theory of knowledge precisely because of the central philosophical and political questions that epistemology tends to address. That what is knowledge, what counts as knowledge, how is knowledge generated and so on. And we have also mentioned how positivism suggests supremacy of science over non-sciences. Now, we are trying to see whether there may be the science, there must be a single science or there must be a single epistemology or, or there is a plurality of epistemologies or a plurality of sciences. The question ontology is the study of existence, nature of existence precisely because of the central philosophical and political questions that epistemology, that ontology addresses. What is being? What is existing? Okay. And then we will discuss de debates on structure and agency in social theory. Okay. In any discipline, there will always be a number of underlying philosophical predispositions in the uh, projects of scientists, 
social scientists, people drawn from humanities and so on. Some of these predispositions involve the nature of social knowledge itself, the nature of social uh, reality and the locus of human control in action. Intellectuals have disagreed okay, uh, about, uh, scholars have disagreed uh, about the extent to which the social sciences to, should ape, should mimic, should copy the methods used in social science, in natural sciences. Whether we should uh, uh, borrow methods from natural sciences or not, there are controversies. Okay. But essentially, social sciences have borrowed so much from natural sciences, okay, so far as methods are concerned. The founding positivists of the social sciences argued that social phenomena can and should be studied through conventional scientific methods. Okay. This, 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 this notion of positivism as you have discussed is closely allied with scientism, if I say positivism, scientism, uh, naturalism, physicalism, Okay. You will find that, that uh, when I say scientism, I mean everything is reduced to science. When I say naturalism, everything is reduced to uh, natural sciences, nature, physical science and uh, physicalism, physical sciences, right. Okay. Positivism uh, always is synonymous with, with scientism, naturalism or physicalism. The doctrine that all phenomena are, are ultimately reduced to uh, entities and physical laws. Opponents of naturalism including, we will we'll discuss when we discuss Max Weber's Verstehen method, method of understanding of social action, observatory understanding and explanatory understanding, we will see opponents of, 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 of naturalism or maybe the school of Verstehen. It is a German word, Verstehen means understanding of social action. O opponents of naturalism, okay, including advocates of the Verstehen method, contended that there is a need for an interpretive approach to the study of human action. A technique radically different from natural sciences, the fundamental task for the philosophy of social sciences has thus been to question the extent which, to which positivism may be characterized as scientific in relation to fundamental epistemological foundations. These debates also range within contemporary social sciences with regard to subjectivity, objectivity, intersubjectivity and practicality in the conduct of theory and research. Philosophers of social sciences examine other epistemologies and methodologies uh, including uh, realism, critical realism, instrumentalism, functionalism, structuralism, interpretivism, phenomenology and post-structuralism. Okay. Social science research in contemporary times is faced with several challenges. Epistemological, I mean what counts as knowledge? that challenge is also posed by ethics, what are the moral foundations of such knowledge, okay. what is the relationship between theory and practice, what is the, the interrelationship between the researcher and the researched. Okay. Suppose you are a researcher and you are going to, to study some community what is the relationship between the two okay? and the research for significant policy making. Epistemology as we have already said, discussed deals with questions such as what is knowledge, what counts as knowledge, how knowledge claims are justified and nature of explanations, subject object relations and fact value relations. In other words, epistemology deals with theories of knowledge and ontology is concerned with 
the existential conditions related to material, social, cultural and political contexts. Though essentially all major social scientists since the 19th century have accepted that the discipline uh, faces challenges that are different from those of the natural sciences, the ability to determine causal relationships, causal relationships means cause and effect relationships, invoke uh, uh, the same discussions held in science meta theory. Positivism has sometimes met with caricature as a breed of naive empiricism, yet the world has a rich history of applications stretching from comp to the work of, of the Vienna circle. Vienna circle means this, this Verstehen method, okay, understanding of social action. Okay. By, the, by the same token, uh, if positivism is, to, is able to identify causality, then it is open to same rationalist non-justificationism presented by Karl Popper which may itself be dis disputed through Kuhn's conception of epistemic paradigm shift. We will discuss these, uh, these debates between Popper and Kuhn later on okay, in this course. Uh, early German uh, hermeneuticians, the proponents of hermeneutics such as Dilthi pioneered the distinction between natural science and social science. Uh, this tradition greatly informed Max Weber and Gimmel's, uh, George Gimmel's anti-positivistic stance and, and continued with critical theory. Since the 1960s, a general weakening of deductivist accounts of science has grown side by side with critics of scientism or science as ideology. I mean everything is reduced to science, that is scientism. Okay? Uh, Jürgen Habermas, for example, argues in his uh, the logic on the logic of the social sciences that let me quote uh, Habermas here that the positivist thesis of unified science, which assimilates all the sciences to a natural scientific model, fails because of the intimate relationship between the natural science between the social sciences and history and the fact that they are based on a situation specific understanding of meaning that can be explicated only hermeneutically. Access to a symbolically pre-structured reality cannot be gained by observation alone. Okay? Then whatever we, we I mean howsoever we produce knowledge is based on our positionality. Okay? Or more often uh, it is based on the context of our social action, positionality, perspective and so on. Okay? Then this, this kind of Verstehen uh, social theory has been the concern of phenomenological works such as Suj in, in phenomenology of the social world and Gadamer's theory and method. Phenomenology would later prove influential in the subject centered theory of the post structuralists. The mid 20th century uh, linguistic turn led to a rise in, a, in highly uh, philosophical sociology as well as so called postmodern perspectives on the social acquisition of knowledge. One, one notable critique of social science is found in Peter Winch's uh, Wittgensteinian's text, The Idea of Social Science and its relation to fif, uh, philosophy. Way back, I think it is it was in 1958 yeah uh, foucault provides a potent critique in his archaeology of the human sciences though habermas and richard rorty richard rorty is a pragmatist have both argued against uh, argued that foucault merely replaces one system of thought with another okay because it is the, it is the study of existence that we are talking about in 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 ontological questions okay because our action is dependent on the context. Okay? Our action depends on the context, our action depends on our positionality, our perspective, our belief system and so on. One underlying problem for the social psychologist is that is whether studies can or should uh, ultimately be understood in terms of the meaning and consciousness behind social action as with uh, folk psychology um, or whether more objective natural materialist and behavioral facts are to be given exclusive study. This problem is, is especially important for those 
within the social sciences who study qualitative mental phenomena such as consciousness, associate, um, associative meanings and mental representations because a rejection of, of the study of, of, of uh, meanings would lead to the reclassification of such research as non-scientific. Influential traditions like psychodynamic theory and symbolic interactionism may be the first victims of such a paradigm shift. The philosophical issues lying in wait behind these different positions have led to commitments to certain kinds of methodology which have sometimes bordered on the partisan. Still, many researchers have indicated uh, a lack of patience for overly dogmatic proponents of one method or another. We must have multiple methods as against positivistic method that there must be one method that, that there is one method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter that that, that is methodological monism we, we, as, uh, and the Wurstehan method suggested methodological dualism. Okay, uh, methodological dualism, and today we we tend to see methodological pluralism. Okay, okay. Uh, I was in Sweden for a conference in 2010. There I met Professor Michael Burawe. He is a retired person now uh, from the United States of America. At that time, he was the president of the International Sociological Association. What he he. Uh, I mean, it was not the first time that I met Michael Burawe, but I met Michael Burawe in Hyderabad also in 2006 and 7. Uh, first Chennai, then Hyderabad, then then the United States of, I mean, then then uh, Sweden, and then Japan and so on. But what Burawe is, uh, Burawe argues that um, social research remains extremely common and effective in practice with respect to political institutions and businesses. Michael Borowe has marked the difference between public sociology uh, which is on public sociology on the one hand which is focused formally on practical applications and academic or professional sociology on the other which involves dialogue amongst other social scientists and philosophers. Okay. And if I have to look at debates on structure and agency in social theory. So far as ontological questions are concerned, this is very important. Um, it has been uh, touched upon mostly by um, uh, Anthony Giddens. Uh, he was the director of London School of Economics and Political Science earlier. Um, he is rated one of the uh, most influential sociologists, social scientists in the world today uh, and critical realists like Roy Bhaskar and so on. Okay. Structure and agency, this, this debate forms, constitutes an enduring debate in social theory. Yes. What is important, whether structure or agency, whether structure or action? Okay. Do social structures determine an individual's behavior or does human agency? In this context, agency refers to the capacity of the individuals to act independently of the structure and make free choices, whereas structure refers to factors which limit or affect the choices and actions of the individuals such as social class, religion, gender, ethnicity and so on. Discussions over the primacy of structure or agency relate to the very core of social ontology. S social ontology. Okay. I mean, what is the social world made of? What is the cause in the social world and what is an effect? One attempt to reconcile postmodern critics with the overlapping, um, overarching project of social science has been the development, particularly in Britain, of critical realism. For example, for critical realists such as Roy Vasker, okay, traditional positivism commits an epistemic fallacy by failing to address the ontological conditions which make science possible, that is structure and agency itself. 
okay then what have we discussed in the second lecture we have discussed august comte and his law of three stages namely the theological stage the metaphysical stage and the positivistic or scientific stage and then in the theological stage how uh, comte divided the theological stage into three stages namely fetishism polytheism and uh, monotheism uh, and what are the central tenets of positivistic stage uh, positivism uh, what are the central characteristics of positivism what are the um, central features what are central tenets of positivism namely methodological methodological monism inductivism systematic verifiability objectivity and neutrality objectivity or neutrality uh, fact value dichotomy uh, observations are pure and indubitable how there is your uh, unilateral relationship between uh, between uh, observations and theory and then we have discussed uh, we have tried to make a compare and contrast between uh, empiricism rationalism and positivism and then we have discussed how epistemology and what is the relationship between epistemology and ontology and how epistemology today must take into consideration the ontological questions that is why I, uh, I, I uh, said uh, that is why we discussed how social science research in contemporary times is faced with several challenges problems ranging from epistemological ethical uh, theory research practice praxis researcher researched um, interrelations and research for uh, policy making and uh, the question of relations between epistemology and ontology assumes greater significance than ever before uh, in other words relations between knowledge and the context of its uh, and the context of knowledge production and the relations between facts and values have become important issues if we want to integrate epistemology with ethics okay now we have come to the closure of the first week okay what we are going to do in the second week i mean that will be the third lecture uh, we'll find that you will you will find that we are going to discuss uh, in the second week uh, three lectures uh, okay we'll start with emil darkheim's uh, rules of sociological method and then we'll move on to in these three lectures we'll move on to uh, influence of sciences uh, on sociology objectivity in social sciences social facts uh, and the autonomy of knowledge or autonomy of sociology and the autonomy and the necessity of science common sense and science comparative social sciences and organic analogy and precursor to functionality these are these have significant methodological uh, argumentative philosophical traditions that we are going to discuss um, in the second week and in the in the third lecture we are going to start with emil durkheim's rules of sociological method thank you <laughs>